Hello and welcome to June's edition of The Lead Out, Cycling Weekly's monthly racing show. My name is Paul Knott and this month I'm joined by Yanto Barker, former pro rider and founder of Le Col. Before we go into this month's episode, let's take a look at last month's headlines. Richard Carapaz won the Giro d'Italia, winning two stages along the way, becoming the first Ecuadorian in history to win a Grand Tour. However, the pre-race favourites had mixed fortunes, with Tom Dumoulin withdrawing with a knee injury on stage five, and Primoz Roglic coming home in third place, having worn the Maglia Rosa earlier on in the race. Anna van der Breggen and Tadej Pogacar took the overall victories of the Tour of California. Chris Lawless won the Tour de Yorkshire in Team Ineos' first official race under their new guise. And Tom Pidcock became the first British rider to win the under-23 Paris-Roubaix, attacking with 20 kilometres to go for a solo victory. As always, another big month of racing there. Obviously the main highlight, Giro d'Italia. Richard Carapaz, one of the outsiders to win before the race, but I'm pretty sure he won't be an outsider ever again now after that convincing victory. It was a really quality ride. You know, you've got to remember um, three weeks of the tour, it's not easy to gauge your form in the first week to the last week. Yeah. And I don't think many people realize, even when you are like the best, you still have to measure your effort and only make them count when they absolutely have to. So um, very mature ride from Carapaz, really exceptional victory. Yeah. and. I mean, earlier in the race, he lost 46 seconds on stage three, that flat stage, which Gagan Hart lost time on, and he was one of the riders as well. And it just shows the Giro, you have to peak at the right time and not panic. If you lose time earlier in the race, it's such a long race. You don't have to worry. And he proved that well, convincingly. If you kind of think about where the mountains really started in the race, Roglic came in with nearly three minutes lead on pretty yeah. much all the rest of the favourites. I mean, that was all gained in the time trial and then the flat stage is when he finished in that front group that then uh, Carapaz won that stage. If you yeah. remember, um, that was that was an exciting finish as well. But unfortunately, you know, one marred with crashes that took Dumoulin out. It's probably a good job for him that he managed to keep that and stay at the front in the first week because otherwise he may not have even made the podium because it was very close between third and fourth. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that fin we were talking about this before we started recording, that finish, the final time trial into the... Verona, it was yeah. like, that yeah. amphitheatre is absolutely incredible. The I thought it was one of the best finishes I've ever seen in the way that he's in the pink jersey. Thankfully, he kept it the time yeah. for all because <laughs> as you watch the race, the clock ticking down was time to pink jersey yeah. and that was very important. Um, you know, he knew he was under control uh, and he would have had all of that information in his radio anyway, but then he crosses the line. He goes onto a beautiful, pristine pink carpet mm. in through, you know, a stone tunnel into an amphitheatre where there's literally all his family and all the supporters and everybody, all the media, which clearly are just, you know, ecstatic. with Every his Ecuadorian who's in Europe probably made right. the... It was amazing. It was, and, uh, for him, that would have been so... It literally makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck, yeah. thinking about it for him, that how that would have felt in that amphitheatre and the way that just wraps you in that energy is amazing. But obviously he was an outsider. There was a few favourites that obviously didn't take the victory. One of the main stories from the earlier part of the race, it wasn't, didn't catch light right at the beginning of the Giro, but the main story was Tom Dumoulin coming unstuck on stage yeah. four and then starting the next day, but literally pulling out immediately. And yeah. probably what the Giro's loss could well be the Tour de France game. Definitely. So I talked about form over three weeks. Roglic yeah. started very high, came down. Carapaz got it just right. Yeah. And then a couple of other riders st really started to come through. Nibley actually kept it really even, yeah. so didn't lose much time, did a good early time trial and then was still strong at the end. Um, I think Dumoulin would have come through really strongly towards the last week. He's, a, he's an intelligent guy. He's very mature and experienced in how to manage his form. So it's a real loss that the Giro missed that fight with him as well as another contender to just give it that extra dimension. But like you say, I think that then is the benefit for the yeah. Tour, which in comparison with the Giro as the way it stacked up in, in the way the race was back-ended and then the combination of climbs and time trials, um, I think the Tour was always looking like it might not be quite as exciting and I think this gives it that extra level. Moving on to the British interest in the race, Simon Yates was one of the favourites before the race. He kind of had an underwhelming race, came eighth overall and made some brash comments before the race as well, which perked everyone up and maybe backfired a little bit. But he still had a pretty top 10 at a Grand Tour you can't sniff at. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
he he is capable of doing yeah. what he may have you know talked about. Yeah, um, we won the welter last year. Yeah, exactly. It's not like he's no sure, yeah. <laughs> but he, but he was always like second tier. Yeah, exactly. Like full contender, and you did think maybe the third week he's going to come through, you know, because he was strong in the first week. But like Roglic, he started out higher in his yeah. so. His surprise was he started out higher on his form cycle than he hoped he was at, and he hoped yeah. there was that next step to go to, which is what he needed for weeks two and three. Um, unfortunately, he was just a bit further than that, so he never got that uplift yeah. with the racing as it really kicked into the mountains at the back end of the race. Um, and yeah, he, he, you know, he had a go. Um, he just never quite had that firepower, that yeah. spark to it like pull it, it off. Always just a bit too far back. Yeah, to, like he was getting back on when they was easing up, rather than you know really being able to go over the top of or go with Carapaz yeah. when he when he went because that's the kind of thing he should have been doing. No, exactly. And then another rider, Hugh Carthy, eleventh overall, which is fantastic for him. Like obviously his big first rider GC with that focusing on the yep. GC picture. And yeah, I mean, he was mixing it with the best. I mean, there was that stage with Nibley where actually Nibley lost his rag with him Nibley. a bit, which you kind of tell that you're yeah. actually doing something right. If yeah. Nibley's if actually there, yeah. <laughs> having a go at you, then you're going to be up there. It was really pleasing to see that. Uh, Hugh has been someone, like, it wasn't a surprise to see him do that, but that doesn't mean he's definitely going to be able to achieve it because he was doing it in Spain in the kind of four to four days to one week stage races where he was finishing in you know similar groups to Chris Froome and stuff or or Lander or whatever on those yeah. mountain top finishes but like I said backing it up week after week is just another category altogether and he's really delivered a fantastic result there like genuinely pleased for him and you know a proper British talent that we should be proud of yeah definitely definitely and not so much a British rider. Well, he's not British in any way. But he rides for Team Ineos and their young team went there. Pavel Sivakov came ninth overall and he's only 21, which kind of... I've, obviously, we've heard about him like coming through the, the, the youth systems and stuff like that. And after Bernal's late withdrawal, he's really, he stepped up and shown that he is on the same level as Bernal, basically. I mean, the the Dave Brailsford mechanism of spotting talent is incredible. Like they can find they can find it wherever you are. But he, you know, he he has. Uh, did he won the um, he won the uh, Tour de l'Avenir, didn't yeah. he? So like, it's not it's not that. No, it's not a surprise, surprise in any way. And but... he is a Grand Tour winner of the future, one hundred percent. Yeah, you know, I should go and put ten pounds on it somewhere. You should. Um, you should. So it's great to see. <laughs> but but again, consistency. You know, he was very mature. He he got dropped, but kept. You know, going at his yeah. pace, he didn't go into the red where then he lost loads of time, which you saw someone like Zacharin do. You know, he won his stage and then he's out the back while there's still 30 guys left. Yeah, like, exactly. It's too big a swing there, whereas Sivakov was much more measured. He knew what he could do. He kept, you know, control of what he was trying to achieve and didn't get overexcited. Moving on to this month's 30 second effort, where myself and Yanto will have 30 seconds to defend one side of an argument. This month, obviously with the Giro in the rearview mirror, but the Tour quickly coming up on the horizon, we're going to ask which is better, the Giro or the Tour de France? I'll let you go first yeah. because, yeah, I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit rusty with it, right, so well, I'm going to uh, let you go. And, I'm going to um, go for the Giro as it's fresh in our minds. Uh, the Giro is definitely the most exciting race between the Giro and the Tour. Partly because at the beginning of the year, everyone is so fresh and um, keen to show what they've been doing and the build-up of form over the previous races. Um, it just makes that crescendo of excitement come into the Giro. Also, the Giro organisers are really clever in designing. Obviously, Italy helps with the type of parkour that it can, uh, it can access. Uh, t the combination of time trials and then um, the, the way that time trials and mounted stages finish to create a very close ending <laughs> so, yeah 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 that's you know i'll just, go with it i don't need to i knew what you're saying you just couldn't get the word yeah out yeah it's fine that's fine three two one so i think that the tour de france is better than the Giro d'Italia because without sounding cliche the tour is the tour that's what it's all about that's what cycling is if you ask the common man on the streets about cycling they're gonna be like oh tour de france that is what it's all about and the race itself it's what everyone prepares for they don't like that everyone is looking forward to the tour every year and the race itself like iconic climbs iconic jersey iconic you know i could just say it. it's just an iconic race and i think it is the best grand tour nicely you kind of nicely yeah done. petered out a bit there but i mean it's not all about us we I asked think the tour didn't give you quite as much 
energy as the Giro, so this I is, that means I win. It's not a 50 second effort, <laughs> it's a 30 second effort. Um, but yes, you know, a strong argument, strong argument for both of us. But we asked our Twitter followers what they thought was the best race out of the two. And, just to let you know, the Tour de France got 65% of the vote and the Giro got 35% of the vote. But, obviously that was just a quick flash poll, so do let us know in the comment section below what race you think is best. Looking ahead to the races coming up this month, and it's all roads leading to the Tour de France now, because the Tour is a tour, and everyone builds up for that. But the Criterium du Dauphiné is possibly the biggest race out of the two. We've got that and the Tour de Suisse, which usually GC riders will go to one or the other. But the Dauphiné looks like it's the more loaded field this year, and with good reason, because uh, Gowan Thomas won last year, went on to win the Tour. Chris Reams won it three times, each time going on to win the Tour de France as well. So it's kind of got, if you do well at Dauphiné, it's, it's a mini Tour de France in effect, isn't it? Yeah, it's all the same riders, all peaking for the same race at the same time of the year, so all in a similar place yeah. in their build-up. So naturally, it's kind of a level playing field. You haven't got people coming who are speci specialising just for that race and then going to go on to something else. So mm. yeah, it's going to be exciting. And yeah, it's and usually a good guide. Yeah, exactly. And this year, it's a bit of an interesting one. They've kind of gone a bit off-road. There's no like big iconic climbs that they've used in the, in the Tour de France previous years, but we may obviously see some of these stages in the Tour in future years and some of these climbs. But some of the key features, so we've got a stage for individual time trial, which is 26.1 kilometres. And then we have a um, summer finish up the Monte de Pipe. I'm going to go with that. Pepe. Pepe. <laughs> and uh, a short stage of 113 kilometres, which is just full of climbs. And as the Dauphiné is usually race, it could easily, the lead could change on that final day. And it's going to be a fast and frenetic race as, as every year. Yeah. So short stages in terms of ingredients are exciting. You take out that middle hold phase. I've probably mentioned it before. You've got exciting attacking part at the beginning and exciting finale part at the end, and you just join them together in a 113k stage, guaranteed to be fireworks from yeah, the beginning. No, exactly. And the winner won't be confident that they've won it until they cross the finish line on the stage eight. And I mean, yeah, as I mentioned, there's a lot of big hitters going there. The main one you have to say is Chris Froome. Um, last time out we saw him was Tour de Yorkshire and the Tour of the Alps, where he was working for his team primarily. But this is, if he's going to be firing for the Tour, you're going to see him at at the sharp end of this race. Yeah, definitely. He won't be, you know, pulling long turns with 100Ks to go for his young teammates, <laughs> which is amazing for them. But now this is about him now. And he's, he's locking into, you know, very serious next phase of the season. And they will have meticulously planned how they want to get through each step in the next build up to starting in July in the Tour de France. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and last year, obviously, he rode the Giro d'Italia, but he's kind of always still been, like we said, he's been helping out his team, but he's had decent performances. He finished 11th, I believe, at the Tour de Yorkshire, and he's always been around that top 20, so it's not like he's been leading them out, dropping off, spinning up the final <laughs> climb. He's still been there as a very, like, showing that he's got good legs this season, and hopefully we'll see him just let loose on, yeah. on this race. Purposefully under the radar, mm. but if you know what you're looking for, very controlled yeah. and clear indication, it's all under the bonnet. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Um, the next one I want to talk about, Adam Yates. First out in since Liege Basson Liege, where he finished fourth. Fantastic ride. And he's also finished top eight of every stage race he's rode this year. So he's, I mean, last year was a bit of a disappointment for the tour, but he's showing that he's looking good, good for this season. You can't underestimate how important the experience is when it comes to understanding your own body, going through the calendar and the season and each race in that calendar <clears throat> to make sure that you bring yourself right to the right place at the right time. And it's, it's an organic process, so naturally there's lots of influences, and it is quite a complex process, so you do have to take a few years to get there, and hopefully I think Adam will have been taking all of that on board and uh, running through the data to be able to give himself the best chance of competing at his highest standard. Yeah. I think it's going to be good. Mm. No, it'll be interesting to see how he performs. And then moving on to the French hopes, uh, we've got Julien Alaphilippe, Thibaut Pinot, Roman Bardet. That, with it being a, a one-week race, I've kind of chucked Alaphilippe in there as well because you could see him m maybe not contend for the overall, but win a few stages perhaps, maybe mix up on some of the shorter stages as well. And another rider heading to the south of France, Richie Porte. Uh, he's obviously started the season on fire at Tour Down Under as per usual and kind of 
drifted away, but came fifth at Tour California, showing that he's still got yep. something there. And with a one-week stage race, he's always got to be a, a contender. I think Richie is another one who is just testing how he gets to his objective. Mm. He's been very selective with his racing. Yeah. Um, he, it's been very purposeful as well, and he's definitely not tried to you know, smash it, smash it, like Roglic has done in the early part of the season. But I do expect to see Richie Port come up now and show where he's at. It'll be a good guide because <clears throat> he's not overraced, he's not tired. Um, so it could be an exciting one. And I think maybe this could be the year for him to really deliver on the potential on the three week tour. Before we move on to the Tour de Suisse, there is the Tom Dumoulin factor. We don't know where he's riding it as we're filming today. I mean, he could well go to the Dauphiné, he could go to the Tour de Suisse. We'll just have to, to wait and see. I but... think he'll pick the Dauphiné. The Tour de Suisse has, the last few years, been really miserable weather. Right. And that's just another element of risk. That's just another element of sort of danger to your health when you're going to high passes and it's snowing at the top. Right? That does happen. So guys want to avoid that. But I don't know. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Tour de Suisse. I mean, it's tough. Not going to lie. Yeah. It's pretty tough. And the, this year, the stage seven summer finish to San Gotardo, which proved pivotal. Like, that is above 2,000 metres. Like you said, it could well be snowing up there. Yeah. Um, the, so there is a TT the next day, which... Obviously, for Tom Dumoulin, that may attract him, but there's one in the Dauphiné. So they're both very similar to type of races. They both have mountain finishes. They don't. They both have time trials. But yeah, there's not as many GC contenders going to the Tour de Suisse. The main one being Geraint Thomas. Well, it's more exciting if you do have a fair split of GC contenders yeah. going to different races, because then you're like, well, how will they when you mesh that group together? Where where do they sort of hierarchy out? Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's bound to be GC guys who are going to Tour de Suisse who will end up very high up in the overall of the Tour de France, and that's the exciting part. Obviously, you know, we Garrett Thomas. Garrett Thomas you know, is Garrett Thomas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, last year's tour. Uh, Eric Mass is someone who's been coming to form again, um, not over raced and controlling how he gets his preparation sorted coming up to the tour. So yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how they how they kind of pit out against each other, and then like you said when they come in yeah. together at the tour is going to be an exciting I think Mass is one of those riders as well he could come in under the radar because Quick Step they won't ride for him in the tour like he'll be obviously if he'd got into yellow early on somehow they'd then obviously have to yeah. but because they have their team would just be full of potential stage winners in all yeah. kinds of terrain he will kind of have to freelance himself and they may see him kind of come in off the radar and there are obviously a few key sprinters to think about and they're mainly we're going to the Tour de Suisse so we have Fernando Gaviria, Peter Sagan, Greg Van Avermaet, Alexander Kristoff like they're potentially the four biggest ones <laughs> coming to the Tour de Suisse and they're all going to be at the Tour de Suisse and it'll be interesting to see how Gaviria is coming off the Giro yeah. and obviously Sagan, GVA and Kristoff they haven't raced for a while and they're going to be fresh and raring to go. Yeah definitely that's another sort of element to the racing that we probably haven't mentioned so far and it's all a bit about GC riders but like you say you know Greg Van Avermaet isn't really a pure sprinter he's more of one of those guys who's going to take advantage mm. of intermediate stages breakaways or um, semi-mountain stages where he can you know get up the road and take some time um, but the pure sprinters you know they they will be raring to go and hopefully you know the tour is such a huge place those those sprint finishes are so important to their careers so important to their CVs and you know their their futures moving on to the final section of this month's episode and it's any other business basically and i think the key race we haven't spoken about is the women's tour which starts next week yeah it does um i'm really excited about the women's tour it's a race that's been getting more and more popular mm. and that's shown by both sponsorship and the crowds and the riders that come to the race have really given its status, you know, cemented it into the calendar, which is fantastic. I think a couple of years ago, it really kind of got there and then it's been staying at a high standard. And um, yeah, I think there's, we've also got some really good British talent as yeah. well, which makes it fantastic to support and watch um, the coverage because you've got those home riders who can mix it with, you know, World Tour or the, the full kind of World Tour yeah. pel peloton. And um, it's every bit as exciting. So it'll be the biggest race in the women's cycling calendar. A lot of the riders say that this could in future years be classified as like a women's grand tour and they've got an extra day this year as well they've got six stages so yep. it's and it's a few interesting ones there's that um kent cycler park like belgian style commessa race which yep. will be inter interesting to see how that all goes and how yep. the, the reaction is to that so i think um it's, it is important for the tradition of cycling to incorporate the newer 
styles of racing into stage racing yeah. and you know the Giro did it with like mountain time trials which isn't you know unique but it's just nice to have that thrown yeah. in and mixture is right and I think the women's tour are doing the same thing and you know it's good it's, it's good modern racing along with the traditional stuff on the stages where you've got you know 160 70 k's of yeah you know standard your, your standard yeah yeah standard type road stages but yeah it should be a i say it's every month it should be a great month of racing once but once we're again into the, we're into this the, is what it's know, all about part of the year this is it you know this is what everyone's dreaming about in december this is we're there now <laughs> no exactly yeah. when you're just this is living the dream <laughs> <laughs> no it should be a really good month of racing but yeah thank you again yanto thank you. and thank you for watching and do let us know your predictions for the dauphiné and the tour de suisse in the comment section below but until next time have a good month and we'll see you then